Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Silicon Valley Health Institute. We are a nonprofit organization where we aim to bring the top experts in many health fields to give you information so you can be proactive in your journey toward optimal health. We're a nonprofit organization. You can go to our website, www.svhi.com, where you can join our email list or join and be a member, etc., or make a donation. Anyway, today we have Dr. Andrew Campbell, who's very impressive, and I was impressed ever since I met him. He was the medical director of the Medical Center for Immune and Toxic Disorders in the Woodland, Texas from 2000 to 2010, and the medical director of Chronic Fatigue and Immune Dysfunction Center in Houston from 1990 to 2000. Both of these clinics treated patients from all over the world. He was selected out of 720,000 to win the Patient's Choice Award 2009 through 2014. He also won the Most Compassionate Doctor Award 2011, International Health Profession of the Year, Outstanding Contribution to Clinical Toxicology in Cambridge, England, 2005. He is the Editor-in-Chief of several journals, including the Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine, Advances in Mind-Body Medicine, the Internal Journal of Complementary and Alternative Medicine and Natural Solutions. He speaks Spanish, French, Hungarian, and obviously some Italian and English fluently, and has, oh, pardon me, and has conversational ability in Arabic and German. So welcome, Dr. Campbell. Thank you kindly. So today the topic is mold, mycotoxins, and the brain. I have to tell you, I'm an evidence-based physician which means that if it's based on medical and scientific evidence, then I accept it. If it's ba based on somebody's opinion on the internet, uh, that's not, doesn't have the backing of medicine and science. To me, it's just an opinion. And as we all saw in the last elections, everybody has an opinion. So, um, Here is a slide I want to show you, but first, this is just what I do and who I am. Now, this is 160 seconds, so just please uh, just listen to this young lady. In 160 seconds, you will decide how this story ends. This is a story about us, the indoor generation, a generation that spends 90% of its life indoors. It all started the day we left nature behind. We filled our homes with lovely things and all the stuff we wanted. Our homes became places we would never want to leave. Artificial light replaced daylight. And we built our houses so that nothing could escape. We cooked and showered, bathed and played, slept and sweated. <laughs> But we had closed ourselves in. To a point where nothing could get out. So when the air turned bad inside, we tried fixing it with chemicals. And we put in little artificial suns everywhere to make the darkness bearable. That's when things started to happen. Hard to notice in the beginning. Some needed help to sleep, to breathe, to not itch. Many of us even started to feel sad. So we turned on happy lamps to make the sadness go away. Then, scientists discovered that the air inside our homes is up to five times more polluted than the air outside. And that the lack of daylight can affect children's learning and increase blood pressure. It turns out that kids' rooms often have the highest concentration of toxicants in the house. In fact, millions of homes are unhealthy to live in. They discovered that living in damp and moldy homes
loans increases your risk of asthma by 40%. And I learned that millions of people like me suffer from asthma and allergies caused by a bad indoor environment. And so, here we are. How the story ends is up to you because it's not written yet. If you care about the evil generation, do something. Begin to think and live differently. Let life and fresh air into your life again. Even small changes can make a huge difference for coming generations. Learn how at theindoorgeneration.com. So, um, the basic principles by which I have been practicing medicine for the past 35 years is first identify the cause, don't treat the symptoms. I see a lot of patients still, and they still say the same thing. I told the doctor I couldn't sleep well, so he gave me a sleeping pill. I told him I had aches and pains, he gave me another pill. I told him I have digestive problems, he gave me a third pill. No, identify the cause, remove the cause, repair the damage, and base your diagnostic testing and treatment on medical and scientific evidence, not on these opinions that I told you a minute ago. So climate change, climate change. This is uh, the unexpected weather in most areas of the planet, more hurricanes and floods, rising waters recently, uh, Louisiana, Texas, Gulf Coast, New York, et cetera disasters, damage, health hazards, uh, mold infested homes, mold infested schools, businesses, public buildings. This is according to the World Health Organization. And just like I said in the beginning, everything that you're gonna see on these slides is based on medical and scientific published evidence. So there's over 100,000 species of mold and about two dozen cause health problems in humans. And we've known a long time about this. It's this described pretty clearly in uh, the third book of the Bible, Leviticus chapter 14, on what to do if a home is contaminated. Why do they get, we have roof, roof leaks, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, condensation, intrusion from all these floods and hurricanes, uh, appliances. We have more appliances now than we ever had. We have. Uh, you know, the door of a refrigerator that gives you water and ice. We have a dishwasher. We have a washer and dryer. There's more bathrooms in homes now, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's poorly de designed foundations, which allows for moisture to creep in. There's cracked cement slabs, bent window framing, contaminated wall cavities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of place where water intrusion happens. So where do these molds grow? Drywall, the underside of wallpaper and basements, underside of carpeting, the ventilation ducts, crawl spaces. Look on your indoor plants. Uh, look at the dirt on glass even. Sometimes in the basements of some homes, there's dirt on the glass and it's growing mold. Ceiling tiles, dust, wood, paper, paint, insulation, and of course, attics. So cellulose and other materials, and when, they, when you have them wet uh, for 24 hours, they promote mold growth. So uh, cellulose is what makes a paper, cardboard, et cetera, and also drywall. So when you drive by Home Depot and Lowe's, and they have drywall outside and it rains, well, guess what? And see what happens is all these things induce a persistent, persistent changes in inflammatory and immune response, and it produces chronic inflammation. Now, what does chronic inflammation set us up for? All these diseases. And that's a trigger for these. Um, mold growth and spores. So molds grow on wet surfaces, they sporulate, and they have different colors, these spores, gray spores, blue, green, black, red, and you have the names of each one of these. 
Dr. Theo Hadidis from uh, Tufts University wrote an article about this three years ago. And sick building syndrome, okay? Um, here it's uh, basically um, out of the New England Journal of Medicine in 1993. That's a long time ago. Any one time, 10 to 25 million workers and 800,000 to 1.2 million commercial buildings in the US will have symptoms typical of SBS. SBS stands for sick building syndrome, which is caused by all that the, that little girl described in the video. So um, after this, um, one second, I'm getting a problem here and getting to the next one. It's not wanting to move along. So um, here we go. So the EPA says that 50% of fungal growth is hidden, meaning you can't see it. It's in between walls, it's in attics, it's under carpeting, et cetera, et cetera. It's in different places. And then when you have people come out to check for spores in the air and uh, these uh, businesses that do that, that only reveals what is present at the time of testing, okay? So let's get into a little bit more about moles. Moles belong to the realm of microbiology. That's the four pathogens that you see here, bacteria, viruses, pathogenic fungi, and parasites. And by the way, these fungi include things like that happen on the skin. For instance, toenail fungus. It includes, uh, uh, you know, the mold that grows between your, your toes. It includes what is commonly called jock itch. All those things are caused by fungi. Mycotoxins is a toxin. It's like pesticides. It's like mercury. It belongs in the realm of toxicology. Um, so things, diseases caused by fungi, mycoses, and those by mycotoxins are mycotoxicosis. Um, two important points about mycotoxins. One, is that a mold that produces mycotoxins usually produces a diff different ones. It's not one mold produces one mycotoxin. That's a misconception. And the other is that if there is a mold that is known to produce mycotoxin present in a home or in a building or in a workplace, then the mycotoxins it produces are present as well. Size matters. So hair is 100 microns thick. Mold spores are about 10 microns thick. Mycotoxins are 0 0.1 microns. So exposure to mycotoxins by ingestion, inhalation, and dermal absorption. In other words, they go right through the skin. Mycotoxins cannot be seen under a normal light microscope. You have to get it on an electron microscope. They're so small. And spores being about 10 microns, that means that they can, as you breathe them, they can go to the deepest part of your lungs. So it takes 500 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes to kill mold spore, uh, to kill, I'm sorry, mycotoxins. HEPA filters are ineffective. Uh, activated carbon, car carbon filters can remove mold spores but not mycotoxins. There's nothing that can really remove mycotoxins effectively because they're so small. So here is medical and scientific facts. Trichotzine mycotoxins are very toxic as you can read. And they infect the brain, the immune system, heart, lungs, intestines, liver, kidney, and skin. Is this something new? No, it was written about in 1983, published in a medical journal article. So 1983 means we've known about it basically for 40 years almost. Um, in 
of the mold, this is from another article by Dr. Thrasher. The greatest concern is the nanoparticles, meaning the ones that are less than 0 0.3 microns. And remember, microtoxins are 0 0.1. So these concentrations of these nanoparticles are at least, a, you can multiply them by a thousand times than whatever the indoor air mold spore count is. These are the mycotoxins. So low levels, but not all mycotoxins are from the indoor environment. You, um, you also get them from many foods. Cereal, beans, fruit, grape juice, beer, coffee, any beans. Coffee is a bean, don't forget. So, um, and this is according to the World Health Organization, the United States Food and Agricultural, the United States, US uh, Department of Agriculture, et cetera. So when you do a urine test, what urine is, is an excretion. So it's what your body is getting rid of. Have you ever eaten asparagus? Okay. What happens for the next few hours? Your urine smells like asparagus. You're getting rid of asparagus metabolites, but the next day you're not getting rid of that because you haven't had any asparagus. So urine in mycotoxins is a good thing, means that your body's getting rid of it. Um, now here's about okra toxin. And the reason I'm telling you this is because okra toxin is a really bad mycotoxin and there's urine tests for this <laughs> but here's the funny thing. Uh, studies have shown that the elimination by kidneys is negligible. But laboratories that do urine testing find it almost in every patient. Anyway, so uh, you've got to be careful in what labs you order. These urine tests don't tell you the real story. And they don't test for mycotoxins. They test for mycotoxin metabolites, just like the metabolites from asparagus. So what are their effects? What do mycotoxin cause? Immune dysregulation. They're toxic to the immune system. They're toxic to your nervous system. They're mutagenic, meaning they change your DNA. They're teratogenic, meaning they can affect the fetus and cause malformations. They're estrogenic, meaning they cause excess estrogen in both men and women. So you have low testosterone in men and too much estrogen in women. And of course they're carcinogenic because they can change your DNA. So um, mycotoxicosis is a poisoning by natural means. Like I said before, like pesticides are having those. But there's one characteristic about mycotoxins and molds is if you get sick from it, you can't communicate it to somebody else. It's a common question I get. Can I give this to my wife or can my, or to my husband or my children, et cetera? No, it does not. It's not communicable from one person to another. So let's look at just a few of these. Here's one, it's called saprotoxin. It's neurotoxic. It causes inflammation in the brain, neurocognitive issues, fatigue, headaches, nosebleeds, chest pain, fever, and oxidative stress, which is also a precursor for inflammation. And at low doses, it can, and I'm translating this, apoptosis of olfactory sensory neurons in the olfactory epithelium. That means you lose your sense of smell. And um, it causes inflammation in the rose, nose causing rhinitis, which means runny nose, and it extends the response into the brain. So you get a mild encephalitis inflammation of the brain. Here's another one, trichothecene. It's a, it's a toxin from stachybotrys. So your capillaries, which are the small, small blood vessels, um, are become very fragile. You have tremors, headaches, seizures, sleep disturbance, incoordination, depression, and anxiety. 
it causes loss of myelin from your brain and from your peripheral nerves. So this leads to CIDP. CIDP stands from chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. It's a very long term. It just means that it strips the myelin from your nerves all over your body, brain, and the peripheral nerves, including, by the way, the optic nerve of the eye. Published studies on this. I have about almost 100 publications. And one, one of them looked at the optic nerve, the other at the acoustic nerve. Um, diarrhea, liver toxicity, and of course, what we call intestinal permeability and the public calls leaky gut. Photosensitivity, rashes, burning sensation of the skin, and a decrease in testosterone and increase in estrogen in men. So um, how do they get into us? You breathe these in and they enter the surfactant of the lungs, which is a, a very fine kind of saran lap thing in the gut. And they're transported through that and go into your blood system, your circulation. And they cause a lot of reactive oxygen species. These cause inflammation. They release cytokines, which are regulators of the immune system to cause inflammation, and they damage the DNA. And what can it do on x-ray or CT or these other imaging? It, emphysema, granulomas, fibrosis is what we see. So the other mode of transportation of these mycotoxins is via the olfactory neurons. This is up in your nose, deep inside. They attach to the nasal mucosa and they're transported up the olfactory nerve and enter the hypothalamus pituitary axis and thereby the rest of the brain. So let's talk a little bit about the brain. It's the only organ almost completely surrounded and protected by bone, the skull. It weighs three pounds or about 2% of our body weight, but uses 20 to 30% of the calories we consume. And from your two carotid arteries in the front of your neck and in the back next to your spine or your vertebral arteries, it receives the most oxygenated blood uh, coming out of the heart. And 60% of the weight of the brain is fat. So uh, a lot of doctors, and myself included, when I see a patient on statin drugs, you know, those are the things that lower cholesterol, I take them off immediately because statins remove myelin from your brain. Okay, so uses the brain uses 20% of the oxygen. The brain, the blood flow, how much blood goes through the brain? 13 gallons per hour, 20% of all the blood pumped out by the heart. That's a lot of gallons per hour. There's 400 miles of blood vessels because there's 100 billion neurons, nerve cells. Well, each nerve cell needs to get oxygen, nutrients, et cetera. So there's 400 miles of these very fine capillaries in the brain. And the brain is different than the rest of the organs of the human body in that it depends almost entirely on glucose as a source of energy. Each brain cell, each they're called neurons, each cell has a thousand synaptic connections. Imagine um, a computer and a thousand wires coming out of it. The ones the brain cells in the visual cortex where you see have 12,000 synapses per cell. Why? Think of yourself outdoors on a nice sunny day and you play ball. You have a tennis ball and you throw it to somebody else 
your brain before you throw it knows what you're trying to do and calculates the strength and uh, so that the ball goes into the right direction and lands in that where the other person is standing and not behind him or in front of him. So it calculates the strength, the arc of your arm throwing the ball and does that in an instant. That's why it has 12,000. Now in the prefrontal cortex, which is in the forehead, behind the forehead, you have 80,000 connections per cell. Why? Because this is where we make our executive decisions, important decisions, moral decisions that affect our life and the life of others around us. Um, there's many studies showing that politicians lack this prefrontal cor cortex. Ha ha ha. Now, each one of these neurons, these, you know, this, this is firing every second and the transmission speed along the, the nerve is 200 miles per hour. Can you imagine what's happening in your brain every second of every day and night? So every person's thoughts, memories, emotions, actions, and reactions are activated in the neurons via these neurotransmitters. So what, how do mycotoxins, how does it feel? What are the symptoms? There's a decrease in short and long-term memory in, in adults and children. So people walk around with sticky notes. It is known to cause autism spectrum disorder. I can't tell you how many children with autism I've treated and now they're fine. The next one is the, the one I told you about before, CIDP, but here I spelled it out for you. You lose balance, you have facial pain, head and neck pain, movement disorders, decreased visual acuity. Um, this is a study that was published uh, a few years ago. This is 119 patients, uh, 79 female, 40 males. There were 20 controls. These patients were all working in a building that what leaked. In other words, on the weekends, they would have to cover their computers and their printers and everything else with tarp. So in case it leaked over the weekend. So obviously there was a lot of mold. So we did nerve conduction velocities. Um, in your nerves, there's two types. There's sensory nerves, the ones that feel temperature, touch, pressure, etc. And those that are motor, those are the motor are the ones that tell your arm to reach for something, your hands to squeeze, your legs to walk, etc. And we tested them and they found, we found that 55 had both types of nerve damage. 17 had the motor, which is the movement and 27 had the sensory. So this was actually in a chapter in a, in a medical textbook. On autism, we know that it affects one in 54 children. 20 years ago is one in 150. In 2017, they took 172 children with autism and 61 controls. These other children had no autism, these 61. So there's a big difference between the two groups. What, it, what this means is the kids with autism had mycotoxin antibodies, elevated mycotoxin antibodies. I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. And another one from Tufts University in Boston showed how mycotoxins cause autism. That was that by that same doctor, Dr. Theoharidis. And uh, we're going to the other end of the spectrum. Autism affects children. Alzheimer the elderly. Dr. Bredesen, who wrote the book, The End of Alzheimer, uh, published a study. Uh, he found three subtypes of Alzheimer disease, type one, inflammatory, type two, non-inflammatory, but atrophic, and type three, cortical, and uh, reported that type three, the cortical, where the amount of brain you have 
shrinks is due as a result from microtoxins. A study showed that in patients who died who have with and who had Alzheimer and at the autopsy of the brain, 28% of them had mycotoxins in the brain. That's very significant in medicine. Then Finland has the highest uh, mortality rate of dementia in the world. And this study in, published in, you know, in 2017 showed that housing was harboring mold and that, that this, these molds were producing neurotoxic mycotoxins. So we can see from both ends, from autism to Alzheimer. Well, let's look at some of the others as well. ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, you remember the doctor at Cambridge University um, who, had, who was in a wheelchair for the longest time and still doing marvelous, marvelous things and writing books. He had Lou Gehrig's disease. And it's a progressive and fatal disease in 90% 90, 90 of cases. And five to 10 of 10% of cases are due to a genetic mutation. But now two years ago, they, a study looked and reviewed all ALS and exposure of neurons, nerve brain cells to mycotoxins and showed a direct link between mycotoxins and ALS. That's highly significant in medicine. Here we go in multiple sclerosis. It's an autoimmune disease. It's one of the most frequent and severe demyelinating problems. <coughs> Excuse me. It affects young people and they become disabled. It causes, it's from demyelinations. People thought this was caused by viruses or genes or the immune system, but they found out those were just associated with MS. But 11 years ago, a study showed that fungal toxins, meaning mycotoxins, are the underlying cause of MS. And we know that the mycotoxin gliotoxin causes, leads to myelination and that causes MS. I want to show you some before and after because this is part of the skin problems and other things that we see. This is before. This is known as mastocytosis, mast cells being affected by immunoglobulin E antibodies to mycotoxins. You see the wrists, the legs, look at the neck. And after treatment, about three months later, everything was fine. Here's a young lady, you can see her back. Her dermatologist thought it was all kinds of different things. And finally, in the middle picture, you can see a little black spot. That's actually with a stitch because the dermatologist finally decided, because nothing worked, decided to take a biopsy and it turned out mastocytosis. After treatment is this third picture. You can see she's delighted. Now here's a gentleman. Look at his ring finger. You see how swollen it is? And his skin here. This is psoriasis with arthritis, with arthritis. In other words, psoriatic arthritis, an autoimmune disease. And here's another picture of his chest. And you can again see his finger here. Now here is treatment after two months. Can you see the improvement? Obvious. Why? Because, and I'll tell you in, in a short, here's psoriasis. This is actually the mom of a very well-known doctor in the whole country. He sent me this picture. Can you help my mom? So yes, I told him, yes, I could. And after finding mycotoxins, antibodies in her blood, this is what she looked like before. And she took these pictures, obviously, with her cell phone. And here it is after treatment. So 
here's what the test look results look like. Now, if you remember in the beginning, I told you that mycotoxins belong to the world of toxins, not the world of microbiology. In microbiology, if you have on this second sheet an IgG antibody, it means previous exposure. In toxins, it means current exposure. And here are 12 mycotoxins. An IgE antibody, this means a toxic reaction that's going on right now and this patient is currently exposed. And this person, is, I mean, this is the other, this, the lab does two tests, the same mycotoxins. One is an IgG antibody, the other is an IgE. The skin that you saw with the, uh, of those young ladies were IgE reactions. And this is not Jennifer Smith, nor uh, anything. And Jane Doe is not a doctor. This is just a representation. But this shows inflammation. And that's what you saw on the skin of the legs and wrist and neck. That's pretty, pretty typical. And um, this is what a, a test result looks like. Now let's talk about testing for indoor mold. It's not standardized in the United States, okay? And it just reveals what is going on at the time of testing. It can vary hour to hour, depending if there's anybody walking across the room, opening or closing a window, opening or closing a door, etc. It does not tell you about any hidden mold, like those in wall cavities, attics, heating and ventilation, air conditioning, all that. And 50% of fungal growth is can be hidden, meaning hidden from sight. And the identification, oh, it's this mold, it's that mold, it's not, does not add substantially in any way to the disease process, okay? So what, when the mold is a concern, here's what you need to check. Check water damage from leaks and any musty odor. Who, who pulls out their fridge and checks the behind the fridge? Who pulls out their um, dishwasher to check behind the dishwasher to see if there's any drip, drip, drip? Or uh, the uh, washer and dryer, same thing. Look under the sinks in the kitchens in the bathrooms. And there's chronic condensation and standing water from air conditioning and humidifiers. What's the condition of the carpet? How old is it? And has it had any water damage? Um, the chronic condition of fabric and porous materials like drapes, upholstery, ceiling tiles, even books. And look at plants. People have indoor plants. Um, I had a patient who couldn't figure out where she was being exposed. It was her plants. She had three pots together at a different uh, height, three pots together, it looked very attractive. And the mold was growing from one pot to the other to the third. So in remediation, you've got to stop the leaks and moisture migration into walls, floors, and vapes. Keep a low indoor humidity, below 60%, ideally between 10 and 50%. And you've got to remove mold damage material, furnishings, other items. Otherwise, as long as you're being exposed to molds, you're being exposed to mycotoxins. And as long as you're being exposed to mycotoxins, no treatment will work. Lastly, any information you need, email me. You have my email at my micro lab. I wanna also mention to you that what mycotoxin antibodies do, these IgG and IgE antibodies, is they bind to human tissue, depending on what it is, and trigger autoimmunity whether it's autoimmune thyroid disease, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, whether it's MS, whether it's lupus, and there's over hundred autoimmune diseases, these can all be triggered by these mycotoxin antibodies. 
So um, uh, there's a lot of information that I've given you. There's a lot more. I give a, a day long course in six hour, one hour, six one hour uh, parts to um, medical organizations like the American Academy of Environmental Medicine and others. And so um, this uh, is a very brief glimpse and you can see that why the World Health Organization is calling mycotoxins the, um, it's, it's calling it the, uh, um, the great masquerader of the century. So um, I'm, 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 I'll be happy to take some uh, questions for you from you and just ask away. Um, uh, I'm, I'm here, I don't know how you wanna do it, but that's up to, to the folks that invited me to do this. And I wanna thank them. I think this, this is a wonderful organization. It's, um, it's had me before, but also it's had other doctors come and talk to you, Dr. Ujdani, who's an eminent scientist uh, he is a genius in autoimmunity, and other great doctors have spoken to your group as well. So thank you very much for having me. We have a couple of questions here that have uh, uh, accumulated in the chat window, and here's one. Um, if you have Stachybotrys tartarum in your office, should I throw away my books before remediation occurs? Well, if you've got um, any mold in your office, you got to get rid of the mold. Uh, and the place to get rid of is where is it growing? You know, is it growing on the books or is it growing uh, somewhere else? Is it uh, all you need is a, the a mold growth about the size of a cotton ball in one of the air conditioning ducts, and it's going to be spewing and spewing and spewing mycotoxins out 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it can be hidden or it's obvious. It, if you're, if, if it's, if the mold, if there's no mold growth on books, don't throw them out. I'm a bibliophile. I keep, I've got my books since I was a kid. So I believe in uh, keeping books as much as possible. So uh, if the books were contaminated with, let's say, mycotoxins from some previous exposure, um, would, would somebody necessarily react in some obvious way if they pull a book off a shelf and open it up and it's got mycotoxins and- They, 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 they may or not because everybody's immune system is unique and different. It's like a fingerprint. So you can put 10 people in a room born on the same month, the same age, same height, same weight, and you get 10 different reactions. Should you leave your house when it's being remediated? When it's being remediated, it's when all the mold spores are, are getting all into the air, et cetera. You should leave it for a couple of days. Um, here's a question from Rachel about uh, SIBO. Um, if, if MCAS is a symptom of underlying mycotoxin, um, uh, is SIBO also? Yes, because many of these, and I, again, I, this was, you know, very short time, but a lot of these mycotoxin destroy the intestinal barrier. And the first place, as we showed in the in, in today, that they attack is the brain, and the second is the lungs. And they affect the intestinal tract, but there are a lot of practitioners use all kinds of uh, what are called sequestrants, um, you know, like bentonite clay and cholestyramine and all these other things to pull mycotoxins. It's not going to pull a mycotoxin out of your brain. It's not going to pull a mycotoxin out of your lungs. 
It's not going to do anything. It's a misconception because I've seen patients who will finally come to see me after they've been to other practitioners who claim to be knowledgeable about mold. And uh, they tell me, oh, I've been on uh, whatever uh, cholestyramine for a year and a half. How did you feel before you started? Terrible. How do you feel now? Terrible. Doesn't do anything. Um, in medicine, there's the National Library of Medicine is available to anybody in the world uh, with a computer. It's called pubmed.gov. P-U-B, like, like an English pub, med like medicine.gov, like government. And there's over 30 million articles from peer-reviewed medical journals on there. So for example, if you look up mycotoxins, you're going to get at least 12,000 or, or more articles. If you look up absorbents for mycotoxins in the intestinal tract, there's 400 articles, but none in humans. They're all in turkey poults, in fried chickens, in piglets, and other animals that eat things that may be on the ground that may be contaminated by molds and mycotoxins. So there's not, there's not a single study in humans showing that these absorbents do anything. Yes, and SIBO is part of the problem. Um, in terms of the chronic exposures, uh, can you give us a kind of ranking of your view of the importance of, let's say, sinus infections versus um, lung exposure, inhalation and absorption through the lungs versus, um, let's say, gut mycotoxin production? Okay, so what happens with inhaling Dr. Ponikow published a study. He's chairman of the Department of Ear, Nose, and Throat Surgery at the Mayo Clinic. And he took 210 patients with chronic sinusitis to the operating room and took out gunk from their sinuses, sent it to the laboratory and tell, told them, tell me what's the most common cause. 96% was due to mold. As far as the lungs are concerned, the, that is so well established that it goes back to the 1980s, uh, 40 years of studies showing how mold spores go into the lung. They go to the deepest part of the lung and they get out into the circulation and they produce mycotoxins because where there's spores, there's mycotoxins. So take a deep breath on your palm of your hand. It's hot and it's moist. And in your lung, it's dark, a lovely place for mold to grow. So these molds grow, they release mycotoxins. And then these mycotoxins then go to other parts of the body via the circulation. What are the most effective antifungals to use when mold mycotoxin tests are positive for an individual, and how do you differentiate which ones to use for a particular patient? Well, again, you have to take every, there is no protocol. You don't treat a 21 year old woman that weighs 110 pounds the same as you treat a 55 year old male who weighs 220 pounds. So you have to individualize it. There's no protocols don't work. Um, I've used many, depending on the patient, how long have they been exposed? Where were they exposed? What do, are their symptoms? Do they have other medical problems as well? Or do they have high blood pressure, diabetes or something? Or are they on medication, including birth control pills? That's the type of medication. All these questions need to be filled. And then the most common antifungal that I've used in my patients is itraconazole but you have to know the dosage and you have to know more importantly, how long you give it for. You give that for a couple of weeks. It's, it's like a drop of water in the Pacific ocean. Rachel, can you unmute, unmute yourself? Hi, um, you sort of addressed my question because I was going to ask about 
binders, talks and binders, but I have a couple of kids and they're three and one, and they were exposed to mold in an older home of ours into the, they were in the room where the most mold was growing. So I had him, my one-year-old having, um, you know, head banging symptoms for brain inflammation. And my daughter had uh, just like incontinence. So I just wasn't sure where to go next with testing and how to address this with also with food sensitivities. Thank you. Well, if, if you've been exposed to molds and you have symptoms, then you need to investigate those symptoms. And when you investigate those symptoms, one direct way is to find out if you have mold anti uh, mycotoxin antibodies. Mold is kind of like the gun. Uh, mycotoxins are the bullet. So when you have that combination, you need to get rid of the bullet. So you find out if your body has any mycotoxin antibodies. What information does that give you? It gives you which one? Second, it gives you the body burden of that mycotoxin. How much are you carrying around in your organs? Third, remember it's a trigger for autoimmune disorders. So knowing if you have these positive or not is very important because you don't want to have an autoimmune disease due to these and then get treated for an autoimmune disorder, which basically really what you should have done is gotten rid of the mycotoxins and been of the mold in your home or workplace, been treated for mycotoxins, and then the reaction, autoimmune reaction goes away. You saw the pictures, you saw what happens. And this is, if, if you show this to a rheumatologist, he won't believe it. If you do find mold in your house um, through, let's say, uh, an agar plate, agar plate exposure and, and um, testing, um, should you assume that all your furniture is contaminated or is it possible that you could remediate that? Anything is possible. It depends on the size of the home. It depends on the concentration in that home. But you should assume that if, say it's only in the basement, well, and say it's a three-story house, do you get rid of things in the top floor? You know, you have to use judgment for each situation. There's no um, one size fits all kind of a situation. Every situation is is unique. I mean, um, you're many of you are in California and I've treated people who live in mansions in Hollywood and that you've watched on TV and seen in movies. And, um, and I've treated people who live in trailers and everything in between. Each case is different. Is colloidal silver a good treatment? I don't use it, never have. How about Lugol's iodine? I about what? Lugol's iodine. I haven't used it or tincture of iodine, yeah. Um, as probably by the end of this month, I will have reached 14,000 patients that I've treated for molds and mycotoxins. I've never used either one of those two in my treatments. Have any of your patients been um, exposed to mycotoxins through, let's say, um, animals and plant foods that have been exposed? Like eating moldy corn, for example, for beef. Um, no, because most of the time eating moldy food will cause your immune, I mean, that'll trigger pretty quickly, very bad feeling, diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, and all those kind of things for your body to get, get rid of it. So, um, and anyway, remember from reading the medical literature, medical and scientific facts, there are cases in Africa where people use it, have to eat moldy things on a regular 
basis, not a one-time event. And those get really affected badly. Also, during the 19, early 1940s, 1942, there was uh, what is known as a Lukia. It was, happened in Russia. People were starving and they ate moldy bread. And the effects were immediate. Um, and is that from the, the mold or from the mycotoxin content of the food? Remember, mold is the gun, mycotoxin is the bullet. So it's a combination of both, but mostly the mycotoxins. Okay. Uh, do you have any uh, um, opinions about the protocol used by Dr. Shoemaker? Um, Dr. Shoemaker has published two studies in his career. Um, and he's proposed a lot of things that have no medical or scientific validity. And so I don't, and a lot of people, I've seen many, many, many of his patients who've gone through, spent $30,000, $40,000 with his method and still feel terrible. I got two emails yesterday from two of those patients um, wanting to come see me, et cetera, because it doesn't work. If it did, everybody would be using it. It's a one size fits all protocol. And the, 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 the thing that is the most important part of that is there's, does it have any medical or scientific evidence behind it? And it doesn't, it's his opinions. So I don't do anything that Richie Shoemaker does, never have. And I've been doing this for since 1990. What testing company do you use um, you, with your and other labs? Testing company for what? For identifying mycotoxins or immune reactions to mycotoxins. I use mymycolab.com. I have to tell you, I have to disclose to you that I'm the medical director, but I'm unpaid. I'm not compensated. If I, it's a title. Every lab has to have a medical director. So it's just a title and they use me because I know and I've published almost hundred studies. So um, I qualify and, but I don't get, and I have to pay for the test just like everybody else, but it's the test that for mycotoxins, this is the test that I use. And I've described in the lecture why urine testing doesn't work. Do you have uh, an opinion about the best way to um, clean, for example, HVAC systems? Um, I'm, I'm a doctor of humans, not of homes. I don't okay. know about homes. Have you, what kinds of nutraceuticals do you use with your 14,000 patients? It depends on the patient. Doctors, uh, two, um, Cardiac specialist, Dr. Steve Sinatra and Dr. Mark Houston have spoken strongly about the need to use magnesium at, at pretty strong doses, so I do, and I've seen that really helps patients. Also, um, and again, it all depends on the patient. There's no one size fits all. So it, I use vitamin D3, I use vitamin C, alpha lipoic acid, I use melatonin because it's a brain protector. I, there's a lot of different ones I use, but I only use uh, maybe three companies because some of the products from other places are powders that you get and you make into capsules. The powders come from China. And so um, I'm not sure about the quality control. The companies are, I use have very well established quality control of uh, the companies that produce the nutraceuticals. Are there mold or mycotoxin risks associated with pets? As I said in part of my presentation, it's not transmissible from one person to another. And it's certainly not transmissible from one pet to another or one human to a pet or from a pet to human.
Is there a connection between mycotoxins and cancer? Yes. As I mentioned in the lecture, it's mutagenic, it changes DNA. The American Cancer Society has recognized several mycotoxins as causing cancer. Susan, do you have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Supposing we suspect mold in our lungs, uh, sinuses, what can we do on our own? Because there's several people, as people referred to, talking about, you know, um, Lugol's iodine and, uh, you know, colloidal silver. What can we do on our own to start uh, getting our sinuses and lungs going toward the proper direction? For example, anytime there's a fragrance around, I start wheezing and coughing, although I don't really have asthma. Is, is that mycotoxin? And what can we do on our own? to, you know, so we don't have some heavy pharmaceutical drugs to address this. The first rule of toxicology is get the patient away from the toxin or the toxin away from the patient. So that's the first rule, because if you're still being exposed to it, doesn't matter what you do or don't do or what you take or what you don't take, and you're still going to have problems. So once that's taken care of, Basically, it depends on the severity of the, of the problem, on the age of the patient, and the length of the exposure. Those are three of the most important things, but there's other th factors to take into consideration. For example, on examination of the patient with a stethoscope, is there any wheezing or any sounds that are abnormal in the lungs? And then if it's in the sinuses, what is the history of the sinuses? How long has there been any chronic sinusitis? Uh, many doctors have written about the treatment for the sinuses issue and molds and mycotoxins. Dr. William Ray, uh, formerly of the Environmental Health Center of Dallas, he died uh, almost three years ago now. He is the father of multiple chemical sensitivity. In his, his patients, he used amphotericin B in his, as a nasal spray. But it's also well been it's also been well established by Dr. Ponikow and others that the use of itraconazole is the best way to go. Fluconazole doesn't work in molds; it only works for candida, and candida is a yeast, not it's different than a mold. So itraconazole is the best one, or amphotericin B in a nasal spray. Would would those have to be repeated or, you know, because, um, you know, frequently, because I, I tend to want to stay away from pharmaceuticals as much as possible. Well, what I tell patients, the most important question I ask them is, how do you feel? Because when they tell me I feel good now, that's it. Go home, be well and multiply. But, um, if they say, well, I'm still having this and this and this and this and this, well, obviously, uh, and, and I mean, I understand what you're saying about pharmaceuticals, but believe me, if you have a pneumonia and you don't take uh, an antibiotic, there's sometimes I stay away from pharmaceuticals as much as possible as, because now we have a variety of things we can use from uh, supplements. Uh, imagine what it was like trying to find supplements in the 1990s. So, um, but still there are certain things that need a, a, a medication that's a prescription drug such as amphotericin B and itraconazole. We have a technical question here about the, the correlation of the IgG um, uh, titers to um, uh, the clinical um, presentation and how consistent and reliable is that? Tess has been around for over 20 years. It's been studied and written about in thousands of publications. It's built well established. It's what is used by uh, uh, medical centers and investigative centers to check, for example, the studies that I showed you that have gone on in the brain 
for people with MS, for people with Lou Gehrig's disease, for people with Alzheimer and people with autism have been using immunoglobulin G antibodies, immunoglobulin E antibodies to mycotoxins. So that's well established. I can tell you from my knowledge that my lab is undergoing two studies with two medical university medical centers, one in the United States and one in Europe. And uh, it, it, what is the comparative evidence with IgA and IgM? IgM is an antibody that the body produces within the first two to three weeks of exposure. So if you've been exposed, most people don't really feel that sick in the first week or two or three. So it's really not, a, it's a test showing that you just got it now. That's why it's not done. IgA is mainly um, uh, an antibody that affects uh, mucosal services, uh, uh, surfaces, and it's been shown in the medical literature to be not an effective marker. Um, we have a question here from Sheridan about uh, a case study by um, Dr. Sidney Baker for treating um, ASD in a child by ridding the body of aspergillus with itraconazole and, and sporonix. Uh, the ch child resolved his symptoms after treatment. Do you have any comments about that? Has it been published in a peer-reviewed medical journal? Uh, I assume so. It says case study but I'm not familiar with it, so I don't know. You can publish a case study in, in Reader's Digest. Mm -hmm. you know, I, would not, I would need to know um, the, the, the medical journal because I know which ones are real journals and which ones are medical magazines. There's a big difference between the two. And I'm not, I have obviously as the editor in chief for two journals as the co-editor in chief of another one and on the editorial board of several other medical journals, I read a lot of articles and I've never read that one. So it may not be in a peer reviewed medical journal. I don't know, it can or could not, but I have not seen it. Uh, do you have recommendations for how to go about finding a doctor who knows um, about mold as well as you do or comparatively as well? Well, there's a lot of mold experts on the internet and basically almost all of them use the shoemaker method, one size fits all. However, there's a number of, of doctors who are um, really um, very, very good at this. I can tell you that many of them are in near the San Francisco area, Los Angeles area, San Diego area. So, um, and they're very good at what they do. And one of the things that, uh, because they've, uh, I've seen their test results uh, from for a patient before the patient starts treatment. And then I see the test results six months later, they check the patients antibodies to molds and they're, it's all green, it's all normal. So their, their treatments are very effective. Some of these doctors are naturopathic doctors, some are not, but they're very good doctors. How about supplement companies that you consider to be the most aware of the um, purity and mycotoxin exposure issues for their supplements? I like Claire Labs. Uh, and I like Jigsaw Health. Can you provide a list of, uh, to some of our audience of doctors that are very good at this in the local areas where they reside? Is there that on your website or how can they access that? Um, well, the laboratory gets serum from all continents. 
So um, it's kind of hard when you're getting uh, serum from Africa, Europe, Asia, Middle East, Canada, South Central America, North America, Australia, uh, et cetera, Japan, to keep track of which doctor did, did what. Uh, and, and it would be kind of like, uh, it, it's, uh, the reason I don't do that is mainly because then some other doctor may be offended that I didn't list him. Doc, a lot of doctors have egos. Don't, you wouldn't know about that, would you? <laughs> <laughs> so the point is, is that um, in order not to offend anybody and to keep the, the, the field level, if, if uh, the lab gets a direct question, I live in such and such a place, is there a doc that you could recommend? Then maybe yes. But I don't want to keep a list. If somebody calls up um, my micro lab and or writes to them and says, uh, who uses your testing system in my um, zip code area, would you answer that? OK, first of all, there is no phone because do you know what time it is right now in Australia? Oh, Australia. <laughs> OK, and what time it is in Hawaii? And what time it is in Israel or Finland? I mean, we'd need a whole slew of telephone operators that are there 24 seven to answer all these questions. So we do everything via the internet because it's much easier and we can answer everybody in a more effective way. So if you have a question, by all means, send me a message. I have an interesting point. Dave Asprey told me that um, that you know the Japanese when they had t coffee that had too much ochre toxin and it was not fit to use in Japan, they sent it all to the U.S. because we don't have such standards. Could you repeat that, please? Dave Asprey had some speaking had spoken to a Japanese health minister, and they were talking about the okra toxins and the toxicity in coffees. And so Dave asked the minister, "What do you do with your moldy coffee that it doesn't pass the requirements for Japan?" And the answer was, he sends it to the United States. Um, although um, I had a conversation with uh, Dave. I'd say a couple of weeks ago, he he didn't mention that to me, and I I don't know what to comment on that. I I've not known Japan to be a um, major source of coffee. They import coffee, and if it if the imported coffee doesn't meet their standards, they send it back to the United. They send it on to the United States, so we get the coffee that doesn't pass their standards. I don't know what their standard is. Clearly better than ours. Well, I can tell you that all industrialized countries limit the amount of mycotoxins in, in foods and in products, foods and beverages, all, all the agricultural things. And it's usually in the parts per billion it's uh, parts per billion, uh, depending on what it is. But uh, I can tell you that I asked a scientist, PhD, tell me what a part per billion is. I'm a visual, I need to see and understand what a part per billion is. He says, take 100 football fields, cover each field with golf balls so that all 100 football fields are covered with white golf balls and take one golf ball away. That's one part per billion. I said, I can see that. I can imagine that a little better. So th th those low dosages and amounts, the, the body just excretes it without nothing. I mean, do you think when you bite a nail or something or uh, 
you know, you're not being exposed to bacteria and viruses. We get exposed to things all day, every day. You know, so uh, when you drool on your pillow, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of things everywhere around us, but it's such small amounts that it doesn't matter. On top of that, we have a very effective system, our innate immune system. The immune system is divided in two parts, adaptive and innate. Innate is the one we're born with. For example, have you ever seen little kids? They crawl on the ground, on the floor, they pick up anything and they stick it in their mouth. Uh, dirty, clean, it doesn't matter. They eat dirt sometimes. And there's bacteria and all kinds of stuff on those things, but they don't get sick because gastric acids kill all that. So for example, Dr. Simon Cutting at Reading University in London, University of Reading in London, did a study on the two most common uh, bacteria found in, um, uh, uh, in probiotics, lactobacilli and bifidobacterium. And he found that more than 90% die in the stomach from stomach acidity. But everybody in the world buys uh, these uh, mycotoxins. So having said that, um, you have to understand that our immune system is very good at getting rid of things that it doesn't need or want. And parts per billion is easily uh, excreted in urine. Violet? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Dr. Campbell, I have a few questions for you. First of all, can you spell the name of the antifungals that you mentioned you use most often in your practice? I-T-R-A-C-O-N. A Z O L E, itraconazole. And the other one I mentioned was that, that Dr. Ponikow and Dr. Ray use is called amphotericin. A M P H O T H E R I C I N. Oh, and thank you. Amphotericin dash capital B as in boy. Okay. You mentioned that there were three different companies that you like to use for clean nutraceuticals that are in powder forms, not from China. I heard you say um, Jigsaw and Claire Labs. What was the third one, please? I'm sorry. Uh, Dr. Steve Sinatra makes a great product and it's, it's called um, uh, Omega Q Plus Max. Oh, the Ubiquinol? It's called Omega Q Plus Max and it has several things. It has curcumin, it has resveratrol, it has coenzyme Q10, omegas, et cetera. Got it, and thanks. Great combination of anti-inflammatory. So those are the three companies that I would uh, recommend. Okay, and then my question, I typed in earlier, but it was paraphrased. So what I was asking was a little different than what was said. I had lab work and it was just blood and the titers of IgG to several molds came back very high. I was being seen at Gordon Medical, which is a really um, holistic integrated medical practice. I wanted to know your opinion so I can compare it to what they told me. Are these reliable indicators of actually needing to actively treat mold? Okay, so in the beginning of the lecture, I showed how in microbiology, you have four pathogens, bacteria, viruses, pathogenic fungi, and um, uh, parasites. When you have an IgG antibody to any one of those, including fungi or mold as they're called, um, it denotes a past exposure. It could have been when a person was in their teens and they went off to summer camp somewhere. It could mean an apartment they lived in or their college dorm or God knows what. 
it does not mean current. That's in the pathogens of microbiology. In toxicology, if you're exposed to pesticides, mercury, um, or, or mycotoxins, the antibodies to IgG are current exposure, as well as IgE, current exposure. So to put you into perspective, uh, IgE mold or IgG mold antibody just means sometime in the past you've been exposed. It could be six months, six years, 10 years, 15 years, who knows? And that's why if you would do blood tests on me, since I'm an old guy and I've been a, a doctor for a long time and I've been sneezed on and coughed on and everything else, you're going to get IgG antibodies to all kinds of viruses. But it doesn't mean I'm sick. Actually, I'm fine. I think that's the end of the questions. Oh, <laughs> Sheridan. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Um, so I actually have a question, Dr. Campbell, about you know a a very uh, long ago exposure. Um, so I'm I'm speaking in the context of my adult son who actually has um, autistic spectrum disorder, and um, he had a, a very large exposure and then had terrible allergies afterwards. So my question is, he never he was never actually actively treated for mold because he's 32, and um, it people weren't talking about it in, in the context of autism and it being sort of a, a, um, a condition that can be a part of the puzzle. So my question is he had terrible, terrible sinus issues, had septum surgery um, as a young adult. Um, could he still have mycotoxins that are in the sinuses and or any other place in the body um, that it would travel? And should I, at this point, encourage him to seek uh, testing and treatment? Well, as I discussed earlier, you can colonize mold in your sinuses and in your lungs. So once they stay there and they colonize, you can have production of mycotoxins from those. Mm -hmm. Continues on beyond uh, the time um, that that uh, the acute exposure was. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Muriel. Um. Yes. Um. So. Um. Do mycoantibodies also ever have protective effects? And if so, how and when? I'm sorry, I couldn't understand well what you asked. Do they have what kind of an effect? Protective. Protective. Against what? Uh, the molds, I guess. No. I mean, antibodies are designed to be protective, and if they're not, that's curious. Okay. We're not talking about microbiology. We're talking about toxicology. So talking about toxicology and you have antibodies to pesticides in your body, you think they protect you against the pesticides? No, they don't. So maybe the question is if an antibody could protect you against the original mold before it had a chance to really produce a lot of toxin. An antibody to a, an a antibody to a mold may somewhat protect you against a mold, but it would have to be that um, every antibody is highly specific. It's like a key in a lock. So if you were exposed to 
mold A, it's not going to, that antibody is not going to help you any against mold B or C or any others. But no, there's a, one thing is antibodies to uh, what you have in microbiology, and it's very different in toxicology. Wes. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, if you <clears throat> see mold, uh, say, uh, under the carpet, you lift it up, uh, 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 you know, do you have to um, uh, replace the floor or can you spray with something like uh, maybe a chlorine spray or, or highly concentrated uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, to uh, kill the molds? Um, I'm a medical doctor that treats humans. I don't know what to do about carpets and homes and things like that. I thought you might. Thank you. I'm sorry. Dr. Campbell, I accidentally muted you. Am I? Uh... There you go. You're back. Sorry about that. Sometimes yeah. Zoom jumps around right when I'm clicking. <laughs> I'll forgive you, my son. <laughs> okay, we have a comment here from um, Jerry that the case study that was mentioned was published in Integrated Integrative Medicine, uh, Encinitas. They used 600 milligrams of Sporinox daily. Does that seem high to you, Dr. Campbell? Um, 60 milligrams? 600 milligrams. Sounds very high. Yeah, so maybe we can pass on this uh, the reference to you. How old is that study? August 2020? Wow, it's not old at all. No, and I'm, I get all kinds of studies sent to me and not seeing that one. My battery is going to die soon. <laughs> I know that there's some questions I probably missed. Susan, do you have any that? Um... Yeah, there is a question on emphysema and acne. Can that be caused by mycotoxins? The World Health Organization calls it the great masquerader. So can emphysema can be caused by it? It was mentioned in one of the slides. So yes. And because it suppresses the immune system, it can cause heightened infections, more frequent infections. Um, there was one question, I don't know if you've addressed it, but tell us more about how mold grows in the body, sinus cavities, etc. They just get in there and grow? Yes. Yep. Okay. Bacteria is like uh, mold is bacteria, viruses, parasites. What do they do? They grow. Okay. They're opportunistic, and if you, if you feed them, they grow. Okay. And is there anything we can do, you know, if we don't get to the doctors on our own to minimize their growth? No. Don't know diet would be helpful? That is always helpful if you avoid all the stuff that we shouldn't be eating, such as, um, uh, you know, artificial flavorings, artificial colorings, artificial preservatives, artificial sweeteners, processed foods, et cetera. If we could go back and eat like people ate a couple hundred years ago, we'd be better off. 
Regarding the great imitation, uh, how have, have you had clients that have had uh, um, acne, for example, that's responded to fungal therapy or anti um, mycotoxin therapy? Well, as you can imagine, having sent, seen almost 14,000 patients, I've seen everything. So, uh, yes. I encourage anybody whose question wasn't answered in the chat because I apologize for us missing some of them uh, to please raise your hand so we can make sure they're addressed. Rachel? Oh, hi. Hi, doctor. So um, what lifestyle recommendations do you have or have you clinically seen to um, just improve a patient's quality of life when they have been exposed to mold? I've heard about sauna and sweating. I just want to know your opinion on that. Infrared sauna. You start low and increase it very slowly. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Violet, last question. Hey there, I was muted while I was talking to you, doctor. I was like, why isn't he answering me? Yes, I will try to be brief. When you told me earlier about the IgG results, what I was asking is, am I correct in, in concluding that it's not a justification enough to actively treat mold in a client just because of those high titers if they're only IgG? Is that what you were explaining? <clears throat> I didn't quite get your question. Stephen, can you translate? Yeah, well, I think Stephen, was, would you be able to not, not mute me so that I can um, ask him a follow-up? I think she's asking is, is it possible that you would have high Ig um, uh, E or um, uh, G um, titers and be asymptomatic and not require treatment? Yes, there's probably a small percentage of the world population, I would say 0.5% that turn out positive to everything. Actually, if you tested them for hepatitis, for all kinds of other diseases, they would be very highly positive, but they don't have any symptoms. They're called hyper responders. And there's, it's a small, very small percent of the population. Thank you. Susan? Would you join me in uh, thanking Dr. Campbell? Well, I see some more questions here. Um, I don't know what this is, but somebody asked, do you recommend taking the visual contrast test? And then somebody asked about if intestinal binders, <clears throat> then how, I guess we, we've already asked this, how do you detox from mycotoxins? Do the HLA genes play a role? HLA genes are another shoemaker invention. If he says that 25% of the US population has this gene, that would mean around 85 million Americans have a gene that uh, is defective. And you would say, you would think that with 25, 85 million Americans affected that the National Institutes of Health would be giving money to institutions to uh, investigate this, to do such and such, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, if you scour the medical literature, there isn't a single article that proves this point. So I think HLA, the binders, they, they, how are you gonna get mycotoxins out of your brain, out of your lungs, out of your sinuses by taking a binder? Secondly, binders bind everything. If you're taking nutraceuticals, it's gonna bind the nutraceuticals. If anyone is any, on any kind of a hormone, treatment, thyroid, whatever. It's going to bind all the hormones. And as I've seen, I can't tell you how many patients that have been on binders for six months, a year, the, older, the, the longest is a year and a half. And they didn't benefit any from it. So I don't believe in those binders. And anyway, there's not a single study showing 
that binders work in humans. They work, yes, in piglets, uh, turkey poults, and fryer chickens, not in humans. Show me a study in humans. Another question, I don't know what this is, but surviving mold neuroquant analysis, is that reliable? No. You and need to base yourself on medical and scientific evidence, not on some book that you can buy on amazon.com. For example, I have a patient who wrote about uh, her journey and, and her book is called, Are You Moldy? Does that mean that she's an expert? No. And I believe Violet has some more questions. So well, let's see if we if, if she has any more. Well, I guess. Would um, <clears throat> um, nebulized hydrogen peroxide help? Never read anything in the medical literature that says it does anything. Although Dr. Um, Thomas Levy. Dr. Levy, Tom Levy recently wrote that it works for um, uh, viruses. And I respect Tom and uh, you know that that is a potential but I've never seen where there's a study that showed it and it worked and, and it made people well again. Okay. Violet is still muted. I think she still has some questions. Let's move on. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. An excellent presentation, and I uh, appreciate your stamina for all the questions. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. You're very welcome. I wish everyone good health.